intensive care at home live stream. My name is Patrick Hutzel from Intensive Care Hotline and Intensive Care at Home. I want to thank you for coming on to this live stream. Today's topic is what should I expect my mum coming out of sedation in ICU and waking up after a tracheostomy in ICU? A question we get very, very regularly um, from our readers and clients. They have loved ones in intensive care that are in an induced coma, can't come off the ventilator with a breathing tube and tracheostomy. And therefore, you know, they want to know what's next. What happens if my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my spouse comes out of the induced coma after tracheostomy? What does that look like? Is it the best option? You know, what are time frames and so forth? And we're going to look at all of that today. Uh, before I go into today's topic, um, you might be wondering what makes me qualified to talk about this topic today. I am a critical care nurse by background. I have worked in critical care, intensive care for over 20 years in three different countries. I have worked as a nurse unit manager for over five years in intensive care and I have consulted and advocated for families in intensive care all over the world since 2013 as part of my intensive care hotline consulting and advocacy service and I am also the owner and founder of intensive care at home where we provide home care services for long-term ventilated and tracheostomy clients uh, as a genuine alternative to a long-term stay in intensive care so that's a little bit about me I do these live streams regularly, usually once a week around the same time. I also upload regular YouTube videos, mainly tips for families in intensive care that you can find on my YouTube channel under Patrick Hutzel. That's uh, Patrick just with a K at the end. And if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, and share this video with your friends and families that can benefit from this information today. If you have questions, please type them into the chat pad. Um, try and keep them to today's topic. If you have questions that are not to today's topic, I will definitely get to them towards the end of uh, this presentation. And I will definitely answer them. I will also give you the opportunity after this presentation to call in live to the show, if you like, uh, and you can answer your questions and I can answer your questions while you're on the call. So let's dive into today's topic. Um, what should I expect my mum coming out of sedation in ICU and waking up after a tracheostomy in ICU? So, you know, one of them May, most of the most frequent, frequently asked questions we're getting is how long does it take to wake up after an induced coma? If people don't wake up after an induced coma, they often end up with a tracheostomy. And then the question is, you know, what do I expect once my mom, my dad, my wife, my husband, my sister, my brother, my son, my daughter has a tracheostomy? What does it look like? You know, what are time frames? Why does it take so long to wake up? You know, can they be weaned off the ventilator? And they have endless questions, and rightly so. You know, it's a highly specialized area, intensive care. It's an area where uh, it's sometimes very difficult to predict what the next day brings, sometimes what the next hour brings. So, you know, they are all very relevant questions. And as you would also know, if you have a loved one in intensive care, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Most patients in intensive care stay there for quite some time. And, um, you know, you want to know what does it look like? What can I expect uh, if a situation happens? Now, before we go, uh, before we break down what happens after an induced coma and tracheostomy, I want to quickly focus on, you know, what should happen before your loved one comes out of an induced coma and has a tracheostomy. What should happen before then is, you should rule out that the intensive care team has done everything beyond the shadow of a doubt to get your loved one off the ventilator and the breathing tube in the first place. 
That is the most important question you should be asking yourself before you even think about a tracheostomy. Has everything been done to avoid a tracheostomy in the first place? That is probably the most important question that you need to answer or that you need to get an answer from the intensive care team from. And they will probably tell you, oh yeah, no, no question, we have done everything beyond the shadow of a doubt. But without a second opinion, you can't really verify that. And that's where we can help you. You know, we can ask the questions with you. We can ask the question for you. Uh, we can get on calls with doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists. We can participate in family meetings. We can set you up with questions, you know, to interpret the information for you and making sure that intensive care teams are actually doing the right things and that they're not just um, telling you what you want to hear but they're actually not following through. Um, so that is probably the most important question that you need to ask yourself, you know. <laughs> has everything been done to avoid a tracheostomy in the first place and get your loved one off the breathing tube or the endotracheal tube? And I have done videos and live streams about this particular topic, you know, what needs to happen to avoid a tracheostomy in the first place. So then... Um, then you need to look at, okay, what sedatives and opiates is your loved one on? Okay, and also how long have they been um, in the induced coma? So a lot of it depends on, for example, if your mum has an early tracheostomy, which means, you know, your, your mum might have come into intensive care after, and, and they're already starting to talk about a tracheostomy after two days, or if your mum has been in ICU for 14 days, there's a different approach and a different outcome. Let's just take the short-term approach. You know, sometimes you have patients coming into intensive care and they really need an early tracheostomy because they might have so many fractures, maybe they've had an NVA, motor vehicle accident, or they have so many fractures or they have a severe traumatic brain injury where the intensive care team can confidently predict, okay, we need to do many, many surgeries here. It'll take weeks for someone to be woken up. Let's do an early tracheostomy. And that may not be a bad thing. And then it'll probably take a while for someone to wake up, especially if there's multiple surgeries um, in the pipeline, you know. Um, so early tracheostomy also doesn't necessarily automatically mean you can wake a patient up straight away. There are situations where you can do that, but an early tracheostomy is often being done if you know, yeah, this patient needs multiple surgeries, has maybe rib fractures, femur fractures, traumatic brain injury, and so forth. So that's when you, um, you know, need to... Um, you know, you can predict a fairly long period of time in the induced coma and no quick wins. Whereas if someone is, you know, let's just say in a two-week coma, they can't come off the ventilator and the breathing tube and they um, then head for a tracheostomy, um, the goal should be to stop sedation straight away pretty quickly, okay? If that is the case, if you can stop sedation pretty quickly, and then you should also expect that your loved one can hopefully wake up pretty quickly. But then it also depends on what sedatives has your loved one been on. Have they been on propofol? Have they been on midazolam or Verset? Have they been on Presidex? Have they been on a combination of all of it? You know, so it really depends on, on what uh, sedatives you are dealing with okay um, it also depends what opiates are being given so as you would know um, when someone is in an induced coma they're also on, on opiates such as morphine or fentanyl and the combination of morphine fentanyl and propofol or morphine fent morphine or fentanyl and midazolam or verset can lead to uh, uh, a prolonged waking up time, okay, can take days, weeks, sometimes even, you know, even months, depending on the circumstances. So, therefore, 
you know, it's hard to predict sometimes how long it takes for patients to wake up. Some, is, some of it is dependent on age. Let's just say, as a rule of thumb, a younger patient is more likely to come out of an induced coma uh, quicker than an older person. Okay, a 25-year-old uh, patient is much more likely to come out of an induced coma quicker compared to a 85-year-old patient. Okay, so that's just the reality. Then, um, some of it will also depend, again, on your loved one's condition. Do they have impaired liver function or kidney function? Because then it simply takes longer for sedatives and opiates to be metabolized and get out of the system. So therefore, you might have your mum being on low doses of sedatives, low doses of opiates, and yes, yet your mum is still in a coma and you stop sedation, and with normal kidney or liver function, medications would be metabolized pretty quickly. And then uh, with impaired kidney or liver function, um, it takes longer, right? The opiates and sedatives are still lingering around in the system because they're not me being metabolized very fast. So therefore, it can take longer to wake up, okay? So... Again, other issues are if there's a head or brain injury, right? Is there a traumatic brain injury? Is there an anoxic brain injury? Are there seizures, right? That all inhibits waking up or prolongs waking up after an induced coma. Hi, Madam. Nice to see you again. Um, so, um, so they are all issues that need to be considered. Then, a lot of it also depends on what ventilator settings your mum or your dad or your spouse is on. So, for example, let's just say you do a tracheostomy, you stop sedation, and your mum or your dad or whoever it is was breathing on CPAP or pressure support ventilation already before they even had a tracheostomy. If you stop sedation, and you should be able to stop sedation once they had a tracheostomy, um, then the goal is to get them onto a tracky mask or a trach mask as quickly as possible, or tra tracky hood or uh, um, a tracky collar, you know, there's different terms. But basically what you do is you disconnect them from the ventilator and you let them breathe just with a oxygen mask over the tracheostomy just with some humidified air or humidified oxygen. That would be the ideal scenario and that is actually the best case scenario. Do a tracheostomy for early weaning, right? That is the best case scenario. But that is not always being possible depending again on the nature of your loved one's critical illness. You know, there are uh, different courses for different horses and it's very difficult to predict what a weaning process, a waking up process looks like. You know, as you can already see, there are many, many variables uh, in, in such a situation. Also, let's just say you're doing a tracheostomy and again, there are still, you know, maybe in the next three days, there is surgery scheduled, right? Would you then, would it then make sense to wake up a, a patient straight away or should you leave them in an induced coma because they're going for surgery and they will come back in an induced coma anyway. Those are all considerations that need to be taken into account when uh, you're looking at predicting what, what it looks like once your loved one had a tracheostomy. Okay, next. Once your loved one had a tracheostomy, you should be looking at Again, stopping all sedation, stopping all opiates. You should be looking at mobilization, early mobilization, very critical in the recovery process. Deconditioning in ICU is real, right? The longer you wait with mobilization, the higher chances are um, you get um, deconditioned and then recovery takes even longer. So from that perspective, if you can predict with certainty that someone needs a tracheostomy and can't be weaned off the ventilator quickly, 
you need to start mobilization as quickly as possible. That's very, very important. My apologies. Need to oil my voice. Um, so then, for example, if you can't move on to um, taking someone off the ventilator pretty quickly after they had a tracheostomy, let's just say you need to continue ventilation in a controlled mode, such as SIMV, um, where a critically ill patient still needs mandatory breaths from the machine, right? You can also predict that there will probably be a prolonged process to wean them off the ventilator. So you, it's really critical to look at the interception where someone has a tracheostomy, what ventilator settings are they on before the tracheostomy? Is it likely for them to get them onto a quick wean pretty quickly, or is it unlikely for them to get weaned quickly? Do they still need mandatory breaths from the machine, for example? And if they do need that, are they able to breathe with the machine? Are they synchronous with the machine? Are they fighting against the machine? Which is something that I've seen over and over again as well. If they are fighting against the machine, either you need to look at changing some of those settings, or unfortunately, sometimes you need to resedate him, which often you know, is counterproductive to doing a tracheostomy because one of the goals of a tracheostomy is to minimize, reduce, stop sedation. So someone can wake up and you can talk them and you can help them with weaning off the ventilator, right? Also, the goal of a tracheostomy is to start mobilization. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't mobilize a patient with a breathing tube, but it's much safer mobilizing someone with a tracheostomy, right? So you can uh, start uh, mobilizing them as quickly as possible. <coughs> it's, uh, I find it, sometimes I find it hard to believe when I talk to people over the phone or when I talk to clients, when I explain to them that you can actually mobilize patients in ICU, they often can't believe it. They, they, I can hear their disbelief uh, when they say, oh, they, they say you can't, I, my, my loved one can't be mobilized. And I say, that's nonsense, right? Some ICUs that I worked in, we mobilize patients with a breathing tube, right? There are special chairs. You can, um, you can uh, move people over to special chairs into a tilt chair. It's all possible, right? With a slide sheet. Um, and I can tell you that uh, recovery, generally speaking, is so much quicker when you start mobilizing people. You know, so don't let ICUs tell you they can't mobilize your loved one. If they do, I tell you they are lazy and complacent. I have no other words for it. There are contraindications to mobilization, again, such as fractures, such as high inotrope use, you know, but even if patients are on dialysis, for example, you can mobilize them as long as they have the vas catheter, the vascular catheter in their shoulders or in their neck. You can't mobilize them if they are in the groin because some of those catheters are in the groin because if you sit up a patient, the groin is kinked and then the vas cath gets kinked and then dialysis uh, clots. So, you know, there are exceptions to this rule and there are contraindications in intensive care for mobilization, but there are many indications for mobilization as well. So then let's assume your loved one gets a tracheostomy, is off all sedation, off all opiates, and they're still not waking up, but they have a tracheostomy. Okay, let's just run through that. Again, it comes back to mobilization. The sooner you can mobilize a patient, the higher chances are uh, their brain gets stimulated, right? Um, imagine you're lying in bed for days, weeks on end. Imagine you would be doing that as a healthy person. Well, I don't think you'd be healthy for much longer, right? Because again, you would decondition as well. So imagine you're sick, you're critically ill, you're lying in bed for days or weeks on end and you're not getting mobilized. There's all sorts of complications waiting for a patient, whether it's thrombosis, embolus, you know, muscle wastage, um, 
swelling, you will see that a lot of patients in ICU are, look swollen because simply they're not being moved, right? And therefore the tissues are swelling, right? Because um, blood is not circulating around. So mobilization is absolutely critical whenever you can. So, um, and you can do mobilization even if someone is, you know, fully ventilated still. You know, the ventilator does not stop people from being mobilized. But if you don't mobilize, you will have a much harder time of getting off the ventilator. So think about this. In order to be weaned off the ventilator, your breathing muscles need to strengthen. Again, if you're lying in bed, you're ventilated, you're in an induced coma, your breathing muscles waste within no time. So in order to strengthen your breathing muscles to get off that ventilator, you need to sit up, you need to do breathing exercises, you need to strengthen your upper body um, and then get gradually weaned off the ventilator. There are patients that can get, off the vent can get weaned off the ventilator very quickly after they had a tracheostomy. I've seen patients, especially younger ones, that can be weaned off the ventilator within a day or two. Right, and then they're just stuck with the tracheostomy. And if you know they're young, fit, and healthy, they cough out the tracheostomy in a few days. That is the ideal scenario. But you know, if you're watching this, I would think your loved one is not in an ideal scenario, and you are wondering what is next for them. You know, and again, it's probably you probably need to get ready for a gradual weaning process, a gradual waking up process. Um, you know, maybe a loved one can have time off the ventilator for two hours a day to begin with on a tracky shield, tracky hood, tr tracky collar for two days, sorry, for two hours, back on the ventilator, have a rest, you know, back off the ventilator again for another two hours, you know, and hopefully increase the time that your loved one can spend off the ventilator. That is the ideal scenario. Um, what is also important to know when you wean someone off a ventilator, you know, you need to see how effective it is and how can you check that? Well, A, you can look at vital signs. For example, if your loved one is off the ventilator, breathing spontaneously with a little bit of humidified air, humidified oxygen, you need to look at what does their breathing look like? Do they, do they get tachypnic? Do they get a high breathing rate? Okay, if they all of a sudden they breathe 40 breaths per minute and their breaths are shallow and their oxygen levels are dropping down, one could, can confidently say they're not quite ready. And therefore, you know, they need to be put back on the ventilator. You can also check that with an arterial blood gas. You can check arterial blood gases. You can see the values in there, PO2, oxygen levels in the blood, carbon dioxide levels in the blood, pH, you know, they're all good indicators in terms of how does a critically ill patient progress towards weaning off the ventilator. Other um, factors you can look at is coughing. Does your loved one have a good, strong cough? Can they protect their airway once they're off the ventilator? No one can get off the ventilator and the tracheostomy if they can't protect their own airway. So if they can't cough, if they can't swallow, uh, it's going to be very difficult to a wean them off the ventilator and b remove the tracheostomy. Coughing is essential, and a strong cough is essential in particular, so you can manage your own secretions. Right, swallowing is important. You know there are patients that after a stroke, after neurological conditions, head head and brain injuries, can't swallow because. Um, Uh, because of their neurological condition and that puts them at risk of aspiration which means they can't have the tracheostomy removed the tracheostomy protects them from aspiration right so those are all factors that need to be looked at next um, when someone wakes up with a tracheostomy um, or they're not waking up let's just say they had the tracheostomy they're not waking up even though sedatives and opiates have been off, you know, but they're still looking like they're in an induced coma, even though now it's a natural coma. What needs to happen is uh, ask for a CT brain or an MRI of the brain. 
to rule out a neurological event. What do I mean by a neurological event? Rule out, see, uh, rule out seizures, rule out a stroke, right? Uh, because that could prevent your loved one from waking up. It may actually not be the sedatives or the opiates. It may actually be a, a neurological event that prevents them from waking up. Now, also, you need to look at if your loved one prior to the tracheostomy, did they have any seizures? Do they have uh, anti-epileptic drugs on board, such as Keppra or Phenytoin? Are they getting other benzodiazepines? that potentially prevents them from waking up. So there are a number of issues um, you need to think of, you know, when waking up doesn't happen in a time frame that's convenient for you or convenient for the intensive care team. Next, you also need to look at how many secretions are there on the chest. So for example, if your loved one can have time off the ventilator, right, do they need a lot of suction? right? If they need a lot of suction, that is another sign that the tracheostomy can't come out pretty quickly, you know, needs more management, needs more nebulization, breathing exercises, physical therapy, chest percussions, and so forth. So that's another uh, uh, sign you need to look for. So um, next, you need to be patient. And you, I'm sure you've heard me saying that before, you know, recovery in intensive care is a marathon, not a sprint. It's often two steps forward, one step back. So when your loved one comes out of the induced coma, has, has a tracheostomy, you know, maybe one day they can have six hours of the ventilator. They can be mobilized. And the next day they're so tired that they can't have time off the ventilator. They need a whole day off to get to recuperate their strength and then the next day maybe they can do eight hours off the ventilator. So it's often two steps forward, one step back. You need to be very patient. Uh, you know, a, a critical illness really knocks people around, right? Um, but, and again, I'm sure you've heard me say that before if you've watched my blogs for any um, period of time, 90% of intensive care patients approximately survive. So there's no need for you to panic most patients in intensive care survive, you know, and I'm not talking here about what does quality of life looks like after, you know, their recovery, um, because we don't know what that looks like. But if they survive, chances are they will get back to some level of quality of life that might be acceptable for your loved one, might be acceptable for you. You know, it's hard to predict, but by not trying you're denying your loved one and yourself the chance to get back to some level of uh, quality of life. So that's it in a nutshell, what to expect, um, you know, when your loved one is waking up after an induced coma and has a tracheostomy. Another thing that is important to notice, when patients come out of the induced coma, have a tracheostomy, bear in mind they can't talk. Okay, so all of a sudden they're slowly waking up. They would be, you know, for lack of a better term, they would be gobsmacked by waking up in ICU. They have no recollection of what's happened. They can't talk, would be very scary for them. Uh, don't be surprised if they appear to be confused, if they appear to be agitated, if they appear to be sometimes even be aggressive because their communication is limited. And sometimes you can try getting people to write, but they're often too weak to write, right? Um, and it's very difficult. And whilst patients with the tracheostomy, once they're off the ventilator, can be trying a speaking valve, it's probably too early in the first few days. It takes some training, it takes some effort, it can't just happen straight away to talk with the speaking valve. So um, there are certainly some obstacles that your loved one has to go through when it comes to weaning off the ventilator with the tracheostomy, waking up after an induced coma. Worst case scenario is the longer they have been in an induced coma, 
There could also be issues around ICU psychosis, ICU delirium, where they could be depressed, you know, they could be staring at the wall, um, which is not nice to watch, but, you know, again, it takes time for them to make sense out of the situation um, and come around. Another issue that can happen after induced coma and tracheostomy is that patients go through withdrawal. They go through withdrawal from benzodiazepines, depending on how many benzodiazepines they had. They go through withdrawal from morphine or fentanyl because they're highly addictive substances in nature. So it's not advisable to just stop midazolam, stop morphine, stop fentanyl. It's advisable to um, reduce it gradually, especially if they have been on high doses, because otherwise, if you stop it too quickly, um, you might go through withdrawal and then you need to manage a withdrawal. And again, I talked about ICU psychosis, ICU delirium, you know, and if someone is going through a withdrawal, that could be um, uh, getting worse, right, uh, with, with going through withdrawal. So, um, that's it in a nutshell. I want to now open the floor for questions. If you have any questions uh, to today's topic or if you have any other questions relating to intensive care, please feel free to ask them. You can type them into the chat pad or if you want to, um, uh, if you want to, you can also call live on the show if you like. You can call on 415-915-0090 our US viewers. That's again 415-915. 0090. If you're in the UK, you can call on 0118-324-3018. That is again 0118-324-3018. Or if you're in Australia, you can call on 041-094-2230. That is again 041-094-2230. Or type your questions into the chat pad. Now, whilst I'm waiting for your questions to come through, um, also want to take the opportunity to thank you for watching the video. Thank you for participating in the live streams. Um, we offer, or I offer one-to-one -one consulting and advocacy as well over the phone via email. Um, you know, you can book a 15-minute free consultation with me if you click on the Schedule My Appointment button on our website or below this video. Um, we also have a membership for families in intensive care. You can look that up under intensivecaresupport.org. Um, you can... Um, we review medical records for your loved ones. If you want to, if you have a loved one in intensive care and you need a medical record review, please contact us as well. We also put a link below this video where you can order a medical record review. Uh, I would love for you to share this video with your friends and families. Give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel for updates for families in intensive care. And uh, click the notification bell. I do these live streams once a week, usually around 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S., which is 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time in the U.S. It's usually on a Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. Sydney, Melbourne Time in Australia. So that's when I usually do these live streams and I will do another one uh, next week. If there are no questions, then I would like to wrap this up today. I'll give it another minute in case you do have any other questions um, to today's topic or to any, any topic that's related uh, to intensive care. If you have a loved one there, um, I'll be gladly to see your uh, questions. And if there are no questions, then I want to wrap this up and, and I'll see you again uh, next Saturday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
10.30 a.m. on a Sunday, Sydney, Melbourne time here in Australia. I wish you and your families all the best. It's a pleasure, Modema. Thank you for your comment. It's a pleasure. Uh, I wish you and your families all the very best. And I will talk to you next week. Look out for my videos that I will publish during the week. Take care for now.